I think we'll begin. Um, we'll start with the bracha, the blessing for um, engaging with the study of the Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai Elohim La'asok Torah. So here we are in Exodus. Uh, it was a quick jump from uh, from where we were last time together. And um, Moses has been introduced. Uh, the birth story, you know, birth stories are very important to religious heroes. Um, but we'll pass over that. And we are now here with him as a young man. He's been <clears throat> adopted into the court of Pharaoh, but he left under bad circumstances, <clears throat> went off <clears throat> into the <clears throat> excuse me into the hills, and has come back having had a religious experience at the burning bush and he re um, reunites with his brother his older brother aaron and the two of them now are a partnership and they've been told by god what to do and that's where we're going to come in so let's start with sharing my screen we're, we're in exodus chapter 7 verse 10. <laughs> There we go. Um, and who would like to start us reading? Uh, Lucy. <clears throat> so Moses and Aaron came before Pharaoh and did just as Adonai had commanded. Aaron cast down his rod in the presence of Pharaoh and his courtiers, and it turned into a serpent. Then Pharaoh, for his part, summoned the sages and the sorcerers, and the Egyptian magician, Egyptian magician priests, in turn, did the same with their spells. Each cast down his rod, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed their rods. Yet Pharaoh's heart stiffened, and he did not heed them, as Adonai had said. And Adonai said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out to the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod that turned into, into a snake. Okay, let, let's just pause there. Um, mm -hmm famous um piece um i'm sure we're all familiar with this scene and what i think um will become interesting is the emphasis on pharaoh's mood and his um his sentiments and attitude which is very unusual in the bible because most of the bible doesn't really deal with emotion at all the Bible, the Torah, the Hebrew Bible is particularly sparse on intentions, motivations, sentiments. Um, it's very much a, a, a narrative, as we know. It, you know, it goes from one incident to another. We don't often get a sense of how, let's say, Abraham felt when he was asked to sacrifice his son on the mountain. We don't get a sense of how did Rebecca feel when she was asked to leave her family and go and marry Isaac. We, we don't get any of those feelings. Um, there was a once a famous essay that was comparing the Hebrew Bible and the Greek um, epic uh, narratives, the Iliad and Homer and, and uh, the Odyssey. And uh, the suggestion was that the Greeks were much more into kind of emotional, uh, you know, everyone got either angry or passionate or fell in love or, you know, the Greeks were into that, but the Hebrews were much more kind of um, one one emotion uh, that everyone did basically everything that God told them to do and didn't worry about it. But here, in this particular passage, Pharaoh is really given you know a character. We kind of have a feeling for him. So the first time we get that is where um, it says in verse. Uh, I don't see the numbers here. Hold on. Thirteen. Thirteen, yes, that's thank you. 
Vihazak Lev Paro, which Chazak is to is to be strong. Um so, you know, at the end of a Torah, um, when we read the Torah, at the end of a, a book of the Torah, we, we say chazak, chazak, meaning <clears throat> we, we've been strengthened by the reading of the Torah. But <clears throat> here the word chazak is in the passive, as our Hebrew group will tell us. Um, it's the nifal, and v'chazek means to be hardened or to be um, to be strengthened against oneself. So... Here the translation is stiffened, but often we'll have a translation that Hefera's heart was hardened. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case, Pharaoh is doing it to himself. It's it's a it's a reflexive. So he's kind of really um hardening himself to the emotions that he's feeling. We have to remember, after all, Moses was his half brother. Um, the he's just inherited the throne from his father, who's died. His father was very successful. This pharaoh Ramses the second is hasn't yet proved himself. The people are keeping these slaves um, in abject poverty and and labor only by virtue of oppression and violence, which of course is always a a, a danger. You know, when 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 the slavery is so violent then there's no reason why the slaves necessarily wouldn't revolt and, and rise up against their taskmasters. So you can get this sense that Pharaoh is feeling really emotional um, and he's kind of hardening himself. He doesn't want to deal with all these difficult things that are appearing before him, and he wants to um, to somehow avoid them. We get that again here in this next, um, where God says, um, Adonai al Moshe kaved lev, Paro, Lev is heart. Kaveh, the word kaveh means heavy. Um, his heart is heavy. Um, here it's translated as stubborn. Um, and me'ain um, lishlach ha'am. Lishlach means to let the, let the people go. He won't let the people go. Um, so we're really getting a picture here of Pharaoh. Now you would think this, this story is about Moses um, or maybe about Maybe it's not about Moses. Maybe it's about God, because in the end, this is not a battle between Pharaoh and Moses, because we have to remember that Moses was just the spokesperson. Moses and Aaron were the spokespeople for what God wanted them to do. This is really a battle between Elohim, Adonai, and Pharaoh, because Pharaoh is a god too. So it's the two gods who are battling (laughs) it out. It's almost like... It, this is like a epic um, Semitic uh, battle of the gods, much like the Greek um, battle of the gods, which human beings are being the uh, puppets between them, much like the the, the story of Troy. So we're we are really um, not that far away from perhaps the Greek um, epic stories and. Um, that is makes this slightly different from other narratives in the Torah. So uh, let's go to verse 15. And, uh, oh, Lucy, you got your hand up. I'm totally unfamiliar with that passage. Somehow I, uh, I kind of s- never, never knew about what happened before the famous let my people go and it was successful. So I didn't, I don't know about the steps. Um, And I'm also was unaware that Moses is the half brother of Pharaoh. You know, I thought Moses was placed um, in the, in the Nile and the bulrushes by his, I guess, sisters. Um, And I, so can you explain those two things? And maybe one more thing. Um, all this magic stuff that's going on, is that unique to this passage or is there a lot of that in, in our Torah? Great. Good. All good questions. Uh, let me start with the magic. So there's not a lot of magic in the Torah. There's a little bit, but it only really appears, um, later on. Um, we have the story of Saul and the witch 
the Witch of Endor. Um, so we we don't get a lot of magic um, at all. Again, I would suggest that we are being influenced in this story by other cultures, whether it's Egyptian culture or Greek culture. Um, this story seems to grow out of a narrative that's not what we might call um, inherently Semitic or inherently Hebraic, Hebrew. Um, it seems to have had influences from other sources. We can talk about why that is a bit later, but um, but that, yeah, magic is not normal. But of course, magic was a big thing in Egypt. In ancient Egypt, magic was a big thing. So we, we are getting the influence of perhaps of an, of an Egyptian culture into this passage. Uh, in terms of Moses, uh, what's his relationship to Pharaoh? So Moses, so a seti was the Pharaoh when Moses was born. Um, his daughter took in um, Moses in the bulrushes. You know, remember that? Um, his daughter, whose name I can't remember, um, had another son called Ramses. So Ramses and Moses were, what would you call that? Is that half-brother, step-brother? Step-brother. Step-brother. Step -brother. So although they weren't of the same, indeed, same mother or father, he was adopted into the family. So by the time Ramses grows up and Moses grows up, they, you know, they grew, they played together, they grew up together in the palace. But then later on, Moses leaves the court of Pharaoh um, and um, comes back. And, and of course, Ramses knows him well. So that what was the first question? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Anybody remember? Oh yeah, I remember. Um, so this passage, it was it wasn't much of a question. It's just that it's new to me. You hadn't mentioned that we would all be familiar with this passage, um, <clears throat> but I have only known the passage um, of "Let My People Go" that was successful. Quickly had to be done quickly, but it was successful. How many of these um, scenes come up before? they're successful in with the Pharaoh to let people go. It's, it's going to be two whole weeks of this stuff. Okay. So this okay. week, <laughs> this week's parasha and next week's parasha. It's chapter and chapter and chapter and chapter. Um, because this, it, one? this is describing the, what's going to become what we're going to be calling the 10 plagues. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I, I can't see everybody at the same time because I'm sharing. So if you have a question, do put your notification up with your hand up and that'll pop into my box. Um, let's, let's read some more. Uh, let's read from verse 15. Someone to read for us, verse 15 and on. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out to the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod that turned into a snake. And say to him, Adonai, the God of Hebrews, sent me to you to say, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. But you have paid no heed until now. Thus says Adonai, by this you shall know I am Adonai. See, I shall strike the water in the Nile with the rod that is in my hand, and it will turn into blood. And the fish in the Nile will die. The Nile will stink so that the Egyptians will find it impossible to drink the water of the Nile. And Adonai said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and hold out your arm over the waters of Egypt, its rivers, its canals, its ponds, all its bodies of water that they may turn to blood. There shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as Adonai commanded. He lifted up the rod and struck the water in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and his courtiers, and all the water in the Nile was turned into blood. And the fish of the Nile died, the Nile stank, so the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. Keep going. Yeah, one more. And when the Egyptian magician priests did the same with their spells, Pharaoh's heart stiffened, and he did not heed them, as Adonai had spoken. Okay, wow. 
powerful thing. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to point out is what Moses asks for. If you are if you are in front of the ruler, and um, your people are, you know, in terrible condition and enslaved, um, and you have the opportunity to speak to the, you know, to the ruler, what are you what are you going to ask for, and what does Moses ask for? What do you what do you say about his his question? He he just wants to let his people go. <laughs> to do what? Worship in the wilderness. Great. So we we quote only a part of this sentence when we talk about it. Let my people go is only part of the Hebrew sentence. It actually says in Hebrew, Shalacheni Elecha. Sorry, start from here. Shalach et Ami via Avduni Bamidbar. Let my people go in order that they will worship me in the wilderness. So here, Moses, who has the opportunity to ask for the world in a way, um, perhaps, he only asks that the people will be allowed to worship their God in the wilderness. They're a desert people. They, um, they, are, they are used to worshiping in the wilderness, and that's where their God has appeared to them in the past. So that's where they want to go. This is not a. This is not the start of revolution, and this is not the start of the Exodus. This is not the point where um, the, Moses is asking Pharaoh to to let the people um, be free and go on their way and never come back. Now we might ask: Is this a strategy or is this a tactic? So, does Moses not yet have the courage to ask Pharaoh? to ask for freedom or is this a tactic you know they'll go into the wilderness and then they they'll they won't come back mm -hmm. so it, it's interesting that these things are developing they're not um perhaps as lucy was commenting earlier the whole narrative doesn't begin with the israelites wanting freedom but rather freedom takes a long time to evolve in the consciousness of a people and it, for its leaders to eventually want to have that freedom. Again, as I've mentioned earlier, not unfamiliar to us when we think about the uh, American Revolution and the idea that at the beginning there was just a, you know, a resistance against the tea and the tax, but later on that became uh, a move for uh, independence but that wasn't necessarily the case at the beginning, and certainly not by everyone. So here again, we're seeing a slow evolvement of this idea of coming to freedom. It's not immediate. Now here we get the first, what we in English call plague, but in Hebrew it's never called that word. The word in Hebrew is makah. We have the word here, makah. Um, it means to strike. Um, and the makot, the strikes uh, against Egypt, there are 10 of them, and that's how the Hebrew understands them. So if you like, they're, they're, um, they're episodic hits against the country and the people and the pharaoh. Each one is slightly different, but they are, they're not supposed to be uh, plagues in the sense we would think of a plague as having you know many years of existence. Um, the Black Plague like, lasted for you know a decade. Um, so we're not thinking about that kind of thing. We're thinking about a strike. It's a one-off strike, um, and we don't know exactly what the length of time is for these ten plagues. Perhaps it took you know up to a year for these things to happen, um, but. It could have been within a month. I, we have no idea how long each one lasts. But obviously, in terms of the idea that this is going to be impossible to drink the water of the Nile, that obviously is a f probably a few days worth, I imagine. Um, and we get a picture here of, um, and I think it's important to look at the details, um, that although God tells Moses to bring 
um, the word to Pharaoh. It's actually Aaron who does the work. So um, Moses says, or Adonai says to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and hold out your arm over the waters of the Egypt. So it's Aaron who actually does the hard work, if it's hard work, I don't know if it is or not, um, <laughs> of uh, turning the water into blood. And um, here we see um, Aaron does that work and all the fish die and it, it, was, it was smelly and they couldn't drink water. Um, but then, of course, the <laughs> Egyptian magicians can do the same magic themselves. And so Pharaoh is not impressed. And we get this idea again that Pharaoh's heart was stiffened and he did not heed them. So um, this is the first chance for Pharaoh to be impressed by God's uh, work, for Moses and Aaron to work together, for Aaron to do the work, and um, it doesn't succeed, which is kind of strange if you think about the story, because um, <clears throat> why would, um, if God is um, the all-powerful, in the story, then so why wouldn't God start with something that would impress Pharaoh and that Pharaoh's magicians couldn't do? What is happening here? Why is why are we going to get ten of these? Why isn't there a, a maybe just one? Um, and we know the last one is pretty devastating, the death of the firstborn. Why does God start with that one? But God starts with kind of this fairly, you know, actually the 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 Nile turning to blood. Um, might be shocking, but it didn't necessarily, wasn't dangerous particularly, um, particularly if after a three or four days it went back again um, and then the next plague came along. So it's kind of a soft approach. And um, it's interesting to think that we're building a narrative here. Each one actually will get a little bit more dangerous and each one will um, become... Uh, something that more and more of the Egyptians will suffer from. Uh, any thoughts or questions at this point? Now, if, if, if BK was here, she would be very impressed because um, I'm going to, I found the original footage of the first plague from ancient Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is impressive. Uh, yeah, she would be very impressed. So hold on a second. Let's do this. Here we go. Show my screen. We've got the sound. It's it's in color as well, which is amazing. <laughs> I didn't realize they had color back then. Yeah. All right. <laughs> No, you're Brenner. Yo, Brenner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this simple yet brilliant trick to heat your home <laughs> like <laughs> thousands of pounds on your heating bill. <laughs> Hail to thee, maker of barley, feeder <laughs> of cattle, carrier of ships, praise of all the gods, Pharaoh of Egypt. You have not yet obeyed the Lord. Let my people go. Point of a sword shall Let him rave on that men shall know him mad. Obey the Lord, or he will raise his hand against the waters of the river. I have come to bless the waters. You have come to curse them. We will learn if a god of shepherds is stronger than the gods of Pharaoh. The water of life. Give drink to the desert and make green the meadow. Aaron, stretch out my staff against the waters. Let 
you may know the power of the Lord. For seven days, Egypt will thirst. Seven days without water will fill every jug and jar. Costumes will be everywhere. For it's seven times seven days. No magician's trick will set your people free. Sacred water, make pure the flood from which you came. God smote the land with all manner of plagues, but still Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Hey. Note how Cecil B. DeMille um, actually <laughs> was fa fairly faithful to the text there. First of all, it's Aaron who puts the staff in the water. It's um, the 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 jar that Pharaoh uses at the end has blood in it, which we are told in the text that there's blood in the water, not not just in the Nile, but in the in every every vessel of water. Um, the the river in Hebrew is is not you the Nile the name of the Nile is not in the Hebrew text. It says Yoar, which is the word for river. So the Egyptians call it the river. Pharaoh calls it the sacred river. Um, so and and you know it, it's pretty faithful i think to to what we're to what we're reading um i want to share with you one other um description depiction of this um get rid of the <laughs> need to get out of this screen here we go and go to here and then share this so this comes to us from medieval times from um <clears throat> from the um the 14th century this is the barcelona haggadah it's a haggadah it's an illuminated illustrated haggadah it's in the um the british library now um probably 13 50 something like that um created in the in the um workshops of of uh, northern spain and here's a depiction of uh the events leading up to the first plague um by the way this is gold leaf at the back mm -hmm. uh, and the red and the blue are precious metals precious uh, dyes that have been turned into paint so it's a very very expensive um piece of art um and as we know in those times very few people would have had such a haggadah but um was commissioned by very rich jewish families um for their table here on the top right <clears throat> we have um the egyptian taskmaster overseeing the israelites who are stamping on the uh, the clay in order to make bricks and there's a brick there on the left mm -hmm. um and the israelites looking fairly impoverished um the next and we're going from right to left which is interesting um because probably the people who actually um did the work might have been christians but it was commissioned by jews um, and paid for by jews um when we think about the jews in england <clears throat> at the same time and we know how wealthy they were um, from our tour of Oxford, this is the kind of um, uh, manuscript they would have commissioned. Here we have the Egyptian taskmaster um, showing how the Israelites are building what are called grain cities. Let's not um, fall into the trap of thinking they were building the pyramids. The pyramids were mm. much more ancient than the date that we ascribe to the Israelites in Egypt. Mm. So it wasn't the pyramids they were building. They were building what are called grain cities or storage cities. And you'll see there's a, a rudimentary pulley system here for getting the, the bricks up to the top of the tower. And here are these lights on the top of the tower. Um, and then down here, for the first time, we have Moses and Aaron. Aaron is in the blue, the blue garment. And Aaron has the cloak around his uh, shoulders. 
and uh, Moses is uh, debating with um, Pharaoh, who is sitting on his throne, and they're turning their rods into snakes. It's the um, the episode we just read at the beginning, <clears throat> and here the Egyptian magicians are also turning their rods into snakes. And here is Aaron holding the rod, and it's turned into a snake. And then finally, on this left um, uh, section, you have uh, Moses in the middle there, Aaron holding the, the rod, um, the Nile turning into blood, the fish swimming in the Nile. There you have the Egyptian farmers farming on the edge of the Nile, uh, Pharaoh in his uh, throne uh, watching. So... Um, here, you know, fairly, again, faithful to the text, um, being creative, but also using the text as, as the uh, origins of their form of art. And we, the, this particular Haggadah goes through all 10 of the plagues um, and shows us what it looks like um, each time. And even if you were, you know, you didn't have access to video um, in the Middle Ages, you, when you were looking at these pictures at the, at the Passover Haggadah, uh, even if you were children or you were adults, you would be quite impressed by how um, how epic this whole story is and how it's having its uh, influence upon Pharaoh and upon the Egyptians and this battle, this great battle that's happening between God and Pharaoh um, at the time. Right, let's go back to our text. <clears throat> So neither Cecil B. DeMille nor the Haggadah show Pharaoh's magicians turning the Nile to blood. No, no. Um, and in fact, to be honest, until I read this again a few days ago, I'd forgotten that they did that. Um, we're going to get that twice. Um, and again, we're going to think about in what way are these plagues actually becoming um, incremental? Uh, what's the difference between them? How are they different from each other? <clears throat> so let's um, go back to 23. Perhaps someone else would like to read now. Pharaoh turned and went to his palace, paying no regard even to this. And all the Egyptians had to dig round about the Nile for drinking water because they could not drink water of the Nile. When seven days had passed after Adonai struck the Nile, Adonai said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says Adonai, let my people go that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. The Nile shall swim with frogs and they shall come up and enter your palace, your bedchamber and your bed, the houses of your courtiers and your people and your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frog shall come upon you and on your people and on your courtiers. And Adonai said to Moses, say to Aaron, hold out your arm with the rod over the rivers, the canals, and the ponds, and bring up the frogs on the land of Egypt. Aaron held out his arm over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. The magician priests did the same with their spells and brought frogs upon the land of Egypt. Okay, so how do you feel now? I mean, it's kind of ucky, you know the blood, the Nile turning, the Nile turning to blood. That that was a great scene, you know, great, um, great thing to look at. And if you can get water elsewhere, okay, fine, doesn't really bother me. But to have frogs all over your house and all over you, um, that's not, mm. uh, you've done better with mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. <we'll get> <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the word for frog is sufadea. Um, you will know that because uh, in the uh, Haggadah, in the Seder, when we dip the uh, the when we dip the red wine, um, we put our finger in the red wine and 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 take out a drop of wine. We say dam, which is uh, blood, safadea, frogs, and then we go through the other uh, ten plagues. So you can now get a sense of what it means to put your finger in this red wine um, and to draw out the drop. Um, of effectively what is blood and say the word blood, um, that ritual is a very powerful ritual in the Seder, not always completely understood. We always make fun of it because people lick their fingers and they like the wine. <laughs> but actually, it's a very powerful moment and it's 
Um, remember, we do it because we want to diminish our joy um, because other people had to suffer because we were able to be free. What's Dick bringing to the table? A frog. Right. <laughs> Kermit, little Kermit. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having that Kermit around, but not not these frogs. Um, now, let's just um, understand the difference between these two plagues. So the first plague, um, we're introduced by um, Pharaoh coming down to the Nile and Moses talking to him and warning him and then saying, I'm going to bring this uh, blood. The second one um, is there's Pharaoh is not involved. Moses just um, Moses goes to Pharaoh and then brings the frog. So Pharaoh hasn't gone anywhere. Um, so if you like, it's just kind of followed on one from the other. Um, and Aaron is still the one who's doing the work. And um, it's interesting, it says that the frogs come up and cover the land of Egypt, Ta'al, Hasafadea in Hebrew. Ta'al means that they come up, which means that they were jumping, um, jumping up. And whenever they're depicted, if you ever see them depicted in, let's say, other medieval documents, uh, manuscripts or the Haggadahs of the medieval period, you'll often see them jumping um, up from the land or from the from the Nile um, to cover the land. But the Egyptians can do the same thing, so not very impressive. Um, and Pharaoh um, summons Moses and uh, says, please get rid of these frogs. Um, and for the first time, he indicates that he will let the people go to sacrifice to Adonai. Again, continuing this theme that this is not about freedom. This is about letting the people have an opportunity to worship their God. Now let's um, read what happens next. So in a sense, plague, plague one and two are together and they're enough to make Pharaoh think again. Um, so let's see what happens now. If someone like to read verse five. And Moses said to Pharaoh, you may have this triumph over me. For what time shall I plead in behalf of you and your courtiers and your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses to remain only in the Nile? For tomorrow, he replied, and Moses said, as you say, that you may know there is none like our God, Adonai. The frogs shall retreat from you and your courtiers and your people. They shall remain only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's presence, and Moses cried out to Adonai in the matter of the frogs, which had been inflicted upon Pharaoh. And Adonai did as Moses asked. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they piled them up in heaps till the land stank. Yuck. But when Pharaoh saw there was relief, he became stubborn and would not heed them, as Adonai had spoken. So um, here we have... Um... It feels like there's going to be a reconciliation, if I may say so, a ceasefire. Um, and it feels like um, Pharaoh has relented. He's going to let them go to worship. Um, and Moses says, OK, I will get rid of these frogs for you. And um, they, they're they dismissed from the land. They stay in the Nile. And at that point, because Pharaoh sees that actually Moses did exactly what he wanted to do. Why should he give in? Um, and the word here again in Hebrew is uh, in verse 11, kaved et libo, his heart becomes heavy or stubborn. And we're getting this sense that um, Pharaoh <clears throat> is someone who, I mean, you could call him duplic duplicitous. You could call him evasive, um, uh, manipulative, uh, but the way the Hebrew text describes him is someone who's, who's really depressed. He's, he's, it's a clinical depression here that he's just can't, um, see what is real. He's, he's, um, he's angry, but he's angry at himself and he can't act. 
he's he's almost paralyzed in his fear um and in his self self um unself-confidence um he's someone who who just doesn't have the um ability to lead in this case it's almost as if this this pharaoh is is a is a statue um you know lucy um i'm thinking this might be a leslie question hi leslie <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't anybody realize that him having his his magicians, you know, do the frog thing and do the blood thing, just added to the misery. Mm -hmm. It doesn't also sound like intelligence. <laughs> You're talking about depression and all that, but it doesn't, why double the problem? Right, so um, here's where we're gonna maybe go off on a little tangent because I'm, nobody's, actually said what well, I'm sure Dick and Leslie are dying to say, which is, what is it? Yes. Who says? Who says? <laughs> what? Did it really happen? Is yeah. it really well, well, of course, I mean, of course, yeah. Um, you know, I think we, we had our most realistic uh, version of this, uh, you know, and with, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, we, we saw it in in technical. Mean to mill. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. So, but I don't think it had to happen. I, that wasn't the point I was going to make because, uh, no, it, I think it didn't happen. But you know, the question is, we're looking at the story as if it were real. Um, so, uh, uh, I think it's fair to make all the points we want to make about this uh, because we are treating the story, you know, as real. If you don't do that then, uh, you know, the Torah study gets a little flat. Um, you know, uh, so we're, uh, uh, we're saying what, what could be learned from this. On the, um, now, the, I, I, as to, you know, uh, Lucy's point about uh, the magicians. Now, the magicians, I think, were just doing it in a bathtub type of thing. They were just sort of saying, yeah, I can do this too. You know, yeah, no, no big deal. scale. Yeah, yeah no, no, no big deal. Um, and you know, but by the way, you know, I, I saw a uh, uh, you know a, uh, a a piece in the Times a couple of days ago about you know uh, uh, by Paul Krugman, uh, their economist on um, you know slavery. So what was slavery about? It was economic. It was economic. This was uh, you know the Southern uh, planters mm -hmm. were the richest people in America because you know they uh, you know they, they were able to have um, they had slaves. Yeah, they they were. So, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, it wasn't just that Pharaoh was being a stubborn so-and-so, uh, there was a real stake here. And, um, you know, if this is just a magic trick, uh, you know, the Hebrews got a, you know, higher class uh, magician than we got, but nonetheless, it's just a bunch of magic tricks. Uh, let's, uh, let's stick it out. So, see what else he has up his sleeve. Hey, Gail. But all, another way to look at Pharaoh is that he's a realist and he's a believer. He realizes he is up against the true God. And he's going to keep trying to be the leader, but he, at some point, at some level, he seems to realize this is hopeless. I'm, again, I'm going up against God here. And who wouldn't be depressed? You know? Right. So that, that relates exactly to what Lucy was asking because if this is a battle between God and Pharaoh, then the magicians are, if you like, surrogates for Pharaoh, just as Moses is a surrogate for God. So where we're using all our weapons at our disposal to try and prove who is going to be, um, who is going to win this battle. And Pharaoh is using his magicians. And for the first couple of plagues, they are able to replicate the, um, the 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 strikes that Moses can do too. Moses and Aaron can do too, and that indicates <clears throat> that you know, again, contemporary parallels. You know, the Houthis do have a few supersonic missiles, and they can throw them at the Americans and the British. Um, but in the end, you know, we're a nuclear power. We and we know what we can do. Um, so the 
as we get further into the plagues, and this is why we may have 10 of them, as we get further into the plagues, the magicians fade into the background. They can no longer do what Moses and Aaron and God can do. So it it is it is somewhat of a an emerging, growing tension between God and Pharaoh. And of course, the people in the middle are suffering, um, whether it's the Israelites in in uh, slavery or indeed the Egyptians um, in Egypt. So well, this this battle is being played out in a battle royal in the skies, if you like. But we are the the epic. This epic poem, if if we can call it that, epic narrative, is uh, using the psychology um, of human awareness, but also a literary narrative that is building and growing and changing um, as we are uh, uh, developing the scenes, each scene. What's a little disappointing about Cecil B. DeMille is that this part of it he doesn't um, doesn't show. So in the movie, and do go back and watch the movie, um, from the blood to the death of the firstborn, he doesn't really show the, the other plagues. Um, so we don't get that sense of ascendancy. We get a big jump from the blood in the movie, from the blood to the death of the firstborn. Uh, obviously, the movie, the movie was already four hours in length, so they couldn't have <laughs> it. It it's it, it in the text. That's why it it appears over two, sh- two Shabbatot, two Sabbaths. We get um, plagues one to seven this week, and plagues um, eight, nine, ten le- next week. Uh, so we have to kind of endure them. But what's also interesting about the reading in the synagogue um, is that many of the difficult passages in the Torah are. Um, when we get to read them in synagogue or later on in other in other scrolls, we often read them under our breath or very quickly. So there's a tradition, for instance, of when we're talking about in Purim, we're, we're talking about the hanging of the ten sons of Haman. Mm. We read it very, very quickly. The tradition is to read it in one breath. Um, so the, the ten sons of Haman are hanged, but the tradition is kind of to... To, to do it very, very quickly. The same goes when um, we read the curses in the book of Deuteronomy. We read them, um, tradition is that when you read them in the in the synagogue, you read them in, in a low voice. You don't proclaim them like you would the rest of the Torah. However, for the story of Exodus, there are no rules um, about how to read this material. It's not as if we're going to be embarrassed by it um we we read it and proclaim it and loudly so um this as i said earlier um feels like it it has some influences from other cultures um and not necessarily completely the way the rest of the hebrew bible reads was this written much later than a lot of sections and that's why it has those influences we have no idea um we date, you know, if 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 we were going to date any of this, we would date the Exodus to um, 1200 BCE, only because that's the time in Egypt when Ramses II comes to the throne. Um, we have, as you probably know, there's no archaeological evidence that there were Israelites in Egypt or that there was a great Exodus of, I think it says, 600,000 people. Uh, from Egypt at that time. So we don't have any uh, evidence, archaeological evidence of any of this. <clears throat> but we we date Ramses II <clears throat> from 1200 BC. Um, we do know that there was a um, there was a volcano eruption in 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 Cyprus, oh. Crete, I think at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wherever it was, which might have affected the you know, the the flowing of the of the of the seas and the waters um you know was the red because there was sand in the water that was colored red whatever so there's a lot of a lot of uh, justification some of these um if you go to sabad um they'll tell you all the reason the natural reasons why um all the 10 plagues happened um but 
um, as, as you know, I see it as a literary epic and therefore it's much more interesting about what it's trying to do from a literary and a psychological point of view, what its moral message is than, than what actually happened. Mm. Um, I think we've got a bit of time to read one more. Uh, if you're if you're prepared to to suffer one more plague, <laughs> bring us another plague. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and then it. I'm going to encourage you to go home and read the rest because you'll then begin to see a pattern between mm -hmm. all of them. Now that you've seen three, you'll begin to see that they are they're actually written in threes. There is a there's a sense of three of each of them, which okay. again kind of indicates that they're really more of a literary device than they are anything else. Mm -hmm. um, the last one stands alone. <clears throat> yes. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so um, we, we've just heard that um, Pharaoh's heart became stubborn. He would not heed them. So we're on verse 12. And someone knew to read. Mm -hmm. Then Adonai said to Moses, Say to Aaron, hold out your rod and strike the dust of the earth, and it shall turn to lice throughout the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron held out his arm with the rod and struck the dust of the earth, and the vermin came upon human and beast. All of the dust of the earth, earth turned to lice throughout the land of Egypt. The magician priests did the like with their spells to produce lice, but they could not. The vermin remained upon human and beast. And the magician priest said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart stiffened, and he would not heed them, as Adonai had spoken. So just Adonai, read, David, just read 16, yeah. 16, okay. And Adonai said to Moses, early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh. And he is coming out, of, out to the water and say to him, thus says Adonai, let my people go, that they may worship me. So that's the beginning of the next three. Now, mm -hmm. do you remember that the first, the the blood, we had Pharaoh's coming down to the Pharaoh coming down to the water, and Moses meeting him at the water. So now, now that's going to happen again. So every third plague, we get this meeting that happens at the water, and um, where the the phrase is repeated: "Let my people go, that they may worship me." So that that's the. That's the literary um, style that's being used here, um, and not unfamiliar to people who read uh, to read uh, to read the Iliad or um, uh, the Odyssey. Peter, would that be right? There's, there's certain kind of epic, theory, uh, yeah. the series of repetitive, rep repetitive, definitely um, kind of phases of the story where you'll get um, yeah. from time to time you'll get that repetition. So uh -huh. um, here we have lice, um, although it's not entirely sure what it means by the word Hebrew word kinim. Um, kinim are the third one. So we have dam, safadea, kinim. Mm. Um, so is it lice? Is it flying insects? Is it flies? Not entirely sure. Um, and um, this time the magicians can't do the magic. So we're getting an intensity that's the next level up. Um, and they they have no more weapons left um, against um, God's acts. Now, what's also interesting here is that the magician priests, as they're called, um, har in Hebrew, harotum, har har Sorry, har mm. Doesn't even sound like a Hebrew word. Har <laughs> um, Reminds uh, me of an Armenian name. Yeah. <laughs> Artumian. Yeah. Artumian. Um, it says, Etzba Elohim. Etzba Elohim. This is the finger of God. Um, in the medieval Haggadot, if you ever, if you look at the pictures, again, I don't know if you have one at home, where the re reproductions of, of these pictures that come from the, the Middle Ages, the um, you, you will never see God depicted, but you will see a finger um, of God. And that comes from this text. Uh, this is the finger of God, because if the text can say um, this is the finger of God, then they can draw God's finger in the uh, Haggadah, and they do that. Um, so we do get the finger of God. Later on in the plagues, um, Moses finally, near the end, says, this is the hand of God. Uh, you remember that we talk about the outstretched arm and the 
um, mm-hmm. hand of God. So, you know, if the finger can do this, the hand can do mm-hmm. so much more. Um, and uh, it's uh, an allusion to the, the intensity that's growing through each plague, each month, maka, as it comes. Uh, let's... Um, and what's the word for finger there? Is it... Etzba. Etzba is the Hebrew word for finger. Etzba. Um, let's um, just see if we can finish. Now, you'll remember this, this parasha does not finish with the last plague, so we don't have the last plague in this parasha. Um, but we get here, just to summarize, um, we get... So we've had we've had the the um, the lice um, at the water, but then Moses releases without talking to Pharaoh. He releases the arov, um, which again we're not entirely sure what they are. Here it says swarms of insects, um, and then at that point, um, heavy swarms of insects, and then Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron again, as we had before, and he says. I'll let you go and sacrifice to your God, but I'm going to let you do it, but are it's within the land, the verse 21, within. Mm-hmm. Now, here's where a little argument takes place. And Moses says, it's not right for us to sacrifice in the land, meaning in the land of Egypt, because if we do that, we're going to be doing things that the Egyptians are not going to like, because we're going to sacrifice, for instance, the cow. Um, and the cow is an untouchable um, beast for Egyptians. So don't force us to do things that the Egyptians will hate us for. So we must go a distance of three days into the wilderness to sacrifice. Now you can see here again, is this a tactic or is this a strategy? Is Moses saying, we've got to get out of this place. We've got to get into the wilderness so we can escape. Or is he saying, actually at this point, you know, we've got some leverage, you know, we we're being allowed to sacrifice to our gods. But Pharaoh wants us to do it within the land, but we want to do it outside of the land. So we're going to push the point. Um, and and uh, Pharaoh doesn't. And Moses, who could actually say, "Oh yeah, we're, it's fine for us to sacrifice to our God. That's all we ever wanted." But he no, he pushes the point, pushes the envelope, and says to Pharaoh, um, "We want to do it in the wilderness." And Pharaoh says, "I will let you go to sacrifice in the wilderness, but do not go very far." Um, <laughs> And he even has the chutzpah to say and plead for me, you know, put one in for me, put a good prayer in for me. Um, and then, um, and then Pharaoh is deceitful, and um, and then he takes away the swarms of insects, and Pharaoh becomes stubborn and would not let the people go. So it's the same cycle, but just at the next level up. You know, it's the next level of intensity, next level of, of inconvenience. And then we're going to get the last three um, in uh, as we begin in, into next week's Torah portion, which you should read next week. Um, and you'll see how then we get the next three, the next level up. And then we get, of course, the final the final wham, which is the, uh, the death of the firstborn, to which Pharaoh obviously has no choice, really. And um, that, that's the end of it. Leslie. What is the source of all this again? I know I've asked this. So, I mean, who first told this story? Where did we get it from? Right. So uh, let's make some speculations from what we know. We know that this story was written down eventually and becomes part of the Torah. We know the Torah was written in Babylonia around let's say the fifth, sixth century of before the common era. But every story obviously has its origins. So was this a story that kind of came out of the desert that had some Egyptian um, influence that um, may even had some Greek influence, meaning that it's at the time of the early of the early Greek states and the early Greek storytelling. Um, did it somehow influence the people who lived in Babylonia so that when they wrote it down, they wrote it in this style, um, having a rudimentary story about about somehow how their ancestors came out of Egypt 
and came to the land of Israel. We, we that's all buried in the the mists of obscurity. But we can speculate that maybe there were traders, and maybe there were people who who were crossing across these continents and bringing these stories, and eventually some probably group of scribes because. We, if you notice, the word Elohim and Adonai are interspersed, mm. and we we know enough now to know that what's called the two schools, the J school and the P school and the E school, are all present here. Um, mm. So somehow there have been groups of scribes, groups of authors, who've created, edited this story, edited to such a fine degree that you know there are the the plagues are listed in groups of three. Um, this is not just a newspaper report. This is a piece of poetry, um, and um, it's come down to us. And we have unchanged. And what's the beauty of it? It's been unchanged from 500 BCE. That's that's the that's the remarkable piece of it. That the Torah was never changed after it was first written down. Um, now we also know that there were no vowels in the Torah. So it's not until much, much later, we're talking now um, around 800 of the common era in in the same place in Babylonia, 800 of the common era. So we're now talking, we're talking... Uh, 1,300 a, years. Yeah, we're talking over 1,000 years when the scribes decided how to point the, the Hebrew letters. Mm. Um, up to then, it had been read without... Uh, without the the points, without the vowels. Now you can read Hebrew without vowels. Everybody in Israel does so. It's not hard to do, but sometimes a word can change its meaning. So, for instance, and and Pharaoh hardened his heart in the beginning of the of the book of X. In the beginning of the first seven plagues, we get that repeatedly. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. We only know that Pharaoh hardened his heart because it's in the form of the verb, of the passive form of the verb, because the people decided to point it that way. Later on, we get the the verb in a different form. It's, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. When we get to the eighth plague, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's the same three letters. It's the same verb. But the um, commentators, or the Masoretes, as they're called, they pointed it differently so that now the God becomes the subject of the hardening, not Pharaoh. So we get the point where at the beginning of the story, Pharaoh is, is hardening his own heart. He's be, becoming resistant to Moses' entreaties. Later on in the story, when actually he perhaps would want to let the people go, Pharaoh says, you know what, I'm going to take this to the very end. I'm not going to let you give in now. You had your chance. No more. Now I'm going to take it all the way to the end. And Pharaoh hardens. Uh, God fa hardens Pharaoh's heart, which is quite a cruel thing for God to do. And again, we have to think liter literary. Well, what is the literary device that the, the story is trying to tell us? If that indeed is what the actual story is saying, or whether the Masoretes, the people who pointed the text, are making a point themselves mm -hmm. at the point. Uh, around 800, we're talking about the time of the rise of Islam. We're talking about the rise of a new pharaoh, um, if you might if you might say that, someone who is persecuting the Jews in a new way. You know, are they feeling particularly angry about that? Can I yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Um, some of our other great stories, like the flood, Noah, we now know have a lot analogs in a lot of other literatures. Is there anything at all like this anywhere else? Nothing in Egyptian literature, nothing. Or any other Middle East or, I no. mean, I don't know. Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware of. How does this compare date wise to the Iliad and the Odyssey, for instance? How, how to, uh, what's the, what, what in, you say? in terms of when it came... It, it, oh, well, Peter, when was the Iliad written? Um, again, it started out as an oral tradition, oh. and we don't really know how when it's how far back it goes. Uh, 
And there were separate stories probably that were later combined into one big epic. We think Homer may have been eighth or seventh century BCE. And it was being performed regularly in the time of the Pisistratid tyranny, which would be the towards the end of the sixth century. And that's probably when they were put into a canonical form where they were the performers would, would at least at the Athens festival would be required to repeat it in the same words every year. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, about five by 500 BC, it was pretty well frozen in a particular form. Uh, with, it was edited later, but uh, mm. interesting, yeah, fascinating uh, period of time. Mm -hmm. Just the last word on the Haggadah. Um, now we think of the Haggadah as the when we describe what a Haggadah is to our non Jewish friends, we might say the Haggadah is the story of the Exodus from Egypt. It's actually not the story of the Exodus from Egypt, it's actually, um, it's a retelling of the story, actually as a midrash. It's actually a midrash. The whole Haggadah is actually a midrash. Um, it is not the same story as the one in the book of Exodus. Um, and it, it's, it's actually um, more, it emphasizes the slavery more than the book of Exodus does. There's actually very little about slavery in the book of Exodus, it the word um, for for um, for what I'm describing is the word avodah kasha, hard work. That's the word that's used in the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. Whether there was that was actually slavery, or whether that was actually indentured mm -hmm. servitude, or it was laboring, you know, hard labor, um, we don't know obviously exactly what it was or whether it really happened. But the Haggadah wants to make out that it is slavery. So when we learn the story of the Exodus from the Haggadah, we get slightly different picture from the book of Exodus itself. So I just want mm -hmm. to remind us all of that um, as we're, you know, not, Pesach is not that far away. And we will mm -hmm. um, hopefully this year at Pesach, um, now that we've learned this text, we will be able to reflect upon that when we get to the Haggadah itself. Mm -hmm. Now, when does the Haggadah date, date from? Dick, Dick, sorry? When does the Haggadah date from? If it, um, the first um, Haggadah that we... We have episode, we have we have some sections of the Haggadah in the Talmud, which we date around 500 of the Common Era, but we don't have the first proper Haggadah till about 800 um, of the Common Era. Mm -hmm. ah. So much, much, much later. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I think we've had a wonderful uh, discussion this morning, mm -hmm. uh, a real epic and a little bit of Pharaoh uh, income. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Devin, you'll have to we tell me. To... I, I managed to unravel a, an ancient video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we even had a frog appearance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a pay extra frog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Shabbat Shalom to everyone. I hope you have a lot of Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom everyone. everyone. Good day. Bye -bye. Shalom trip. Shabbat Shalom from England. Ah, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.